we, I think we're, what we're going to do while we're just to, to fill the gap is just talk about hand pressure. And um, just as an introduction, what we observe um, across the world is that hand pressure is applied without um, any uh, logic. It's just done as something to do. So the, the typical approach to dealing with um, non-progression or abdominal pain or some other problem is to uh, just try things randomly, uh, turning the patient um, uh, abdominal compression or whatever it might be. And what we advocate is that you try to do things more logically so that um, in the future, when you're presented with a problem, um, you can diagnose the problem and execute the best solution and if you are trainers, then it's much better if you can explain to the trainee what's going on and um, what the problem is and what the solution is and how to execute it. So a key part of this is uh, applying abdominal compression. And um, we, we see people applying compression in all sorts of places. You know, they, they apply it randomly um, without much idea of what they're actually trying to compress. And the key, the key thing is that the bit of the colon or the scope that you're trying to uh, compress needs to be accessible. And um, basically, uh, only two or three places where uh, the scope is accessible for compression. The most anterior structure is your transverse colon and pressure is most effective in this place. And if you look at the configuration of the colon and when, when pressure is likely to be effective, it's usually after you've passed the splenic flexure and we're in the, either the mid transverse colon or you're in the prehepatic area. And applying pressure here in the mid transverse, often in an upward direction or towards the right shoulder, will enable this, this area to be pushed up to insert. And of course, that then allows you to push around. Okay, so I would say if you, your number one pick for hand pressure is going to be the transverse colon, usually in the mid transverse colon. The second issue can be at the hepatic flexure. And we just had that discussion about how hand pressure can be helpful at the hepatic flexure in the previous case. There are a couple of other scenarios. So you have a situation where your splenic flexure here rotates posteriorly. And I've mentioned this before. So you've got a phrenic ligament, and you've got the diaphragm and basically the colon comes up and then goes posterior and then comes anterior. And when it does this, it has the propensity for this proportion of the, what is effectively the descending colon to come anteriorly and it forms a knuckle. So what happens is you come up and you have the situation where it loops up like this and then eventually comes across the transverse colon. And this thing here can be very difficult here. And if it comes up anteriorly, you can apply some hand pressure just here, pushing down to try and suppress this to allow you to get around the corner. Sometimes this is best done on the back because obviously if you're putting pressure on the supine. abdomen, supine rather, um, the patient supine lying on their back, it's easier to put hand pressure, direct hand pressure down. But actually the splenic flexure is best negotiated really in the right lateral because it opens up the, the fold. Um, so if you think about gravity in the right lateral, gravity is going this direction, it will pull the transverse this way and open up the angle here. Okay, so interestingly, the right lateral is the best position for the splenic flexure, but if you're applying hand pressure, it's usually best to have the patient supine. In which case, I'm just going to touch on one other thing. Uh, water. So you're all using air. It's very interesting. Uh, so I just brought up the screen, the difference between air and water. I think there's a shift in technique at the moment in colonoscopy practice to be using water intubation. Uh, we tend to use water intubation. Right. Draw the call on. We tend to use water intubation up to the point of the splenic flexure. 
And that allows us largely to have the patient left lateral occasionally supine. And then after that, this way on, we use CO2. Um, what does water do? Well, I've put the five, six things up on the, on the screen there. It will clean the mucosa. So even if the bowel prep is good, a little bit of extra cleaning never does any harm. Secondly, it weights the colon. So it makes the colon heavy. And the, the heavier colon is less likely to move. And it also gives you better loop control because the colon is heavy. And then there was a fantastic publication where they had something called a sigmoid bulbulus, which is a full loop on a, of the sigmoid on itself. And uh, they basically just ran in water and the water undid the volvulus all by itself. So water will probably help reduce loops without you actually having to do anything with the instrument itself. Um, the water will give you the distension you require, but obviously it, dist it distends less with water than it does with air. And the key thing here about the air and the water is if you're using water, you suck all the air out. So sucking the air out and making the um, lumen purely distended by water is a key thing. It will magnify things and the polyps tend to float up in front of you. That can be come, and that's really useful. And I have little doubt that it causes less uh, pain than, than normal air intubation. So I know you're all using CO2 here, but it might be nice over the course of the day for one of you to try a water intubation, at least into the left colon. Because I, I think this, this is a real shift in practice towards using water intubation. Um, has anyone tried this in the room? And they're all, we have Maria saying yes, the rest is shaking no. You all using CO2? Yeah, they do. I tried it here. So it would be sure. nice to see that today. I'm not hearing you, but um, so they're, so they're using. Yeah, first things they're first, you it. need a pump. You need to suck out the air. A cap's really helpful because um, you're going to look, look at something called the innominate grooves. Oops, can't spell grooves. So instead of looking at the big folds of the colon, you'll see that on the on the lining of the bowel, there are lots of little fine lines. And you're going to be very close to these and you want to be using something called near focus whilst you're underwater. So the technique is slightly different, but actually I think it is a step forward in clinical care and clinical practice at the moment. So I don't know who's up next, but if they want to, you can try doing a water intubation. Who's up next? Um, I will often use a small amount of buscopan on intubation um, to reduce the spasm and the resistance the spasm causes, but um, uh, I'll be using it 70 to 80% of the time on extubation uh, to make uh, inspection easier. And I noticed when Zander was removing that polyp, uh, there was some movement of the colon, um, and particularly during polypectomy, you don't want the colon moving um, when you're trying to uh, snare a polyp. You want to make it as still as possible. So I'd encourage you to uh, think about buscopan. Again, it's a question of integrating into your practice, mastering the use of it, using the correct use, and only dismissing it if after that a competency um, uh, achieving the competency of using it, that you should consider dismissing it. Uh, we talked about completeness of seeker intubation, but we also did retroflexion. So I asked you to talk through uh, the retroflexion, but um, yeah, maybe go through it again, what you did here. So in this case, the gentleman okay, was on his back. It's not the optimal position because you want really a lot of insufflation in the ascending colon. So actually left is, is, is a bit more um, advised. But then again, I did see that I could insufflate the, the ascending colon quite nicely. It was quite broad. So um, I decided to do it in this position. Um, where you in, in initiate the, the deflection of the tip depends a bit on, on the configuration, I think. At this no, just point. pause there. Mm -hmm. uh, John and Roland, where do you normally is initiate the uh, retroflexion? In the ascending colon or in the cecum? 
Um, I usually start slightly above the other sickle valve. So my, I've got my tip maybe two centimeters distal to the valve. Okay, so you would be like here then? Yeah, but it depends. Yeah, absolutely. It, but it depends really where the cecum is lying. You see, the, the problem here is that you've got that very um, uh, bowing laterally in the ascending colon. So if you can just imagine the tip is retroflexed here and you pull back, getting round that central ascending colon bend with the tip retroflex might be a bit tricky. That's very interesting. And how would you move to change that? Because, of course, for as far as we understand, we're putting the left lateral help. Well, that <clears throat> that may help, uh, but it doesn't always. And and I so what what John and I have been trying to do is work out when, in what circumstances, is retroflexion difficult. And this is one of them where you've got um, a very lateral ascending colon like that. Uh, the other situation is where there is um, a big anterior movement of the scope um, it more, dis more distally in the colon, either, in other words, either in the sigmoid or in the transverse colon, if it's bulging um, mm -hmm. in either of those two places, because you need to rotate the scope. And if you rotate the scope and there's a loop or a bulge um, uh, further back in the scope, then you, you just very difficult to rotate it because it goes all over the place so so those are the two circumstances i agree with Sander. the left lateral is the best because you've got the best insufflation of the uh, of the right colon uh, but if you want to retroflex in the cecum you know you might be better placed at the, the patient in the right lateral because looking at that scope position at the moment that the distal four to five centimeters of the scope will be in inflated bound in the right lateral position. I mean, there's yeah. a risk David, if you if you have a medial cecum, standard intubation, the cecum is going to be medial, and you retrovert in the cecum. When you retrovert, you're going to be looking at the ascending colon, and that angulation be quite tight. Whereas if you pull back a little bit, so the scope is relatively straight, which means you have to be usually above the ileocecal valve which means you're, instead of having a, 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 a slightly incomplete circle, you've effectively got a nice open loop and it stops straight. When you then retrovert, you're looking back up the ascending colon. Yeah, uh, that's a nice way of thinking about it. So he does do it on the back here. And uh, I'm encouraging you to look at, so there are some things I've been noticing throughout the day so far. Uh, look at the way Sander is holding the scope. There, this distance, there is distance off the leg. A lot of the times when we're watching you guys scope, there's a lot of hanging the scope on the patient's leg, and you need some space here, as Ronan was saying before, uh, to operate the wheels. Um, Sander is a bit turned to his left hand side. It's interesting. We'll see why that is in a minute. Um, and then, so here is the sequence of things that you do. So first, you're operating the up-down, right, Sander? You're yeah. first operating your up-down and your left-right to maximum. So you see there, he takes hand off the shaft and does this here. You can actually do that with one hand, and I would encourage you to uh, improve your ability to operate the small wheel to do that with one hand. But there is, yeah, there is absolutely nothing wrong with doing that because what you really do want is the tip to be as small as possible, and that is achieved by... Um, max big wheel and max small wheel if you want to call them that and then he you did say here very nicely and then you just need to push a little bit uh, i do agree with that like it's a, a, just a very small amount but absolutely you should not try to achieve this maneuver by pushing like you might do in the rectum because you will cause a perforation especially in a patient who's asleep who cannot cause cannot give you feedback um and then it's so the maneuver for retroflexion we go through it again uh, let's just get back off it, um, is look, get your position, maximize your big, and you see your small wheel, uh, gently push in and turn the shaft. So there's a lot of turning going on here. And then you can pivot with this hand down and this hand up or vice versa to change the position. And it's very nicely demonstrated here. Um, Roland, I presume, just looking at this, that his tip now is looking at this bulge and this bulge is here maybe is that right from what you understand of this yeah 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 so the yeah so 
Well, yeah, probably. When you say bowls, do you mean the... The the, 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 the lateral bowling that yeah, you were yeah, talking yeah. about before of the ascending curlon? Because I mean, it strikes yeah. me that this is not a bad retroflexion view. No, no, it's good. No, he's got the right curlon well anticipated here. Um, he doesn't have a lot of AP movement in the sigmoid or the uh, transfer, so he gets a reliable uh, clock, anti-clockwise talk. And one question I'd ask both you and John, do you think that it's almost always anti-clockwise talk that you're applying in this situation, or do you not know, or do you think it's... The majority of the time for me, if I'm blinking, that answer that question, it's anti-clockwise, yeah. But it can be clockwise, and you see Xander do it here, a combination of first anti-clockwise and then clockwise to look in the 360. And I think once you have the, it, that interests in what John thinks, once you have it in retroflexion, then I'm often then switching my hand, like Xander switches his hand onto the other side of the scope and going clockwise to get a full 360 view. The, lo the logic would tell you the initial action would be better anti-clockwise because in theory, you'll bring your splenic flexure forward and it will actually drive the instrument in and facilitate the retroversion. Once you're retroverted, I agree, you can do it either way, but the, the, the logic would tell you the easiest way to do it would be to apply anti-clockwise on the initial retroversion yeah and then you see it, it just uh, the hand thing so you see that there where he switched his hand from one side to the other that is to facilitate the addition of torque uh, and so that is something that you can definitely do in your practice if you're struggling to apply torque because your hand is against the scope just take it round and re-pick it up again uh, and ju uh, just finally about what i mean i do find the image a very useful for retroflexion to see if it's going to work. I don't, I haven't deconstructed it like you guys have, I think, but I do find it very useful to decide if a retroflexion is going to work or not. And I haven't broken it down. So it's very interesting to hear. It would be very interesting to do a whole session on why the, when and when, when it will and when it won't work based on the imager. Um, because in, in my mind, there are configurations. I don't think I've broken them down enough where it clearly will work and ones where it clearly won't work. But what is very useful for me is that when you see the tip like this, obviously you have a, an optimal retroflexion position and that, that doesn't cover the other parts and the, the sigmoid and the and the mechanics of it, but it does cover the fact that your tip is clearly in the right position to, to do retroflexion. Have you got any other tips on the well, no, so I, mechanics of uh, retroflexion? I think the, you know, deconstructing when it doesn't work and why it doesn't work is still work in progress. And I would say the same for the rectum, you know. So uh, occasionally uh, rectal retroflexion is very, very difficult and we need to just, just deconstruct that a bit more. But I think the two main things are what, <clears throat> how straight the right colon is. Um, yeah. And the second thing is whether you've got looping um, further down the colon. Um, that definitely makes it more difficult. All right. Uh, I think right. that's good. Yeah. Is I mean I I think what what we find is that when, when I ask nurses in units and in my own unit I say well how often are other people retroflexing in the right colon they say well there's only two or three of you doing it uh, at all really and um, it isn't a difficult thing to do safely but, but you do have to be careful but the key thing is you need to develop retroflexion skills to um, remove some polyps not just find them so. Um, being able to retroflex in, in the colon is really, really important skill. That's absolutely right. Uh, we had a nice demonstration. We had a course yesterday on um, polypectomy skills, and we had some very nice demonstrations of needing to use retroflexion for polypectomy. Uh, once you start, I mean, it's, it's totally alien. So once you start doing um, polypectomy and retroflexion, it's an alien thing because everything is backwards. So pushing in is pulling out and pulling out is pushing in. And the movements are up and down and all over the place, but it, it is something that you know, beyond your skill levels now, okay, but it's something that you should add to your armamentarium later because it is it can be 